Okay, so um, we, we do love talking about our social impact projects, but um, uh, the truth is that uh, they're not our bread and butter. Our bread and butter is working uh, for large organisations fixing big gnarly problems. Um, so, sorry, it's just dying. Um, so this is a case study uh, about realestate.com.au. Uh, I personally spent uh, about a year there. Um, and just to, to reinforce that, that they are big, I'll give you some numbers. So they're the number one property site in Australia. They have a somewhat staggering 7 million uniques a month. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking about two things, how uh, we learn to kick off projects better, uh, and also a particular case study about the development of the iPhone app. Um, which, which happened quickly and was a huge success. Um, the, the best number on that one is that the, at present the iPhone app gets 10 times the ROI events that the web gets. So ROI events mean things like calling an agent, sending to a friend, um, those kind of events that the advertisers really, really see as valuable, not just views. Um, so yeah, we'll start off with uh, how kicking off projects. So uh, a large project, uh, lots of stakeholders, how do, you, how do you get it done quickly? So I think lightweight planning is, is part of it. So we've got a, a fairly prescribed set of tools that we use cards for. We lay those out. And this sort of uh, plan for a two-week uh, inception or, or kickoff workshop uh, happened in about 45 minutes. Um, the basic structure is always understand the business drivers, define the, the, the customer experience, use that to extract out stories, have a project plan and delivery plan. Um, so. I'm going to sorry. I'm going to focus on that the red zone, the three days that we spent on on customer experience with a somewhat large team. There was about 20, 20 people in this workshop. Um, before I sort of jump to the end, what does success look like when you give yourself three days with a team that size? I think success looks like this. So that's Sarah, the project sponsor. She's standing up in front of the sketchboard and she's de she's describing the, the customer experience that they're aiming for to the entire project team. Um, there's a mix of the usual developers, designers, project. Uh, testers. Uh, and from my point of view, from a designer's point of view, I'm not pitching an idea. Um, the, 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 the primary uh, owner of the project is, is describing what they've come up with together. So, you know, it's, it's an important shift. Um, so, in those, in those sort of workshops, again, you know, we've got a repeatable framework for doing this uh, that I've described, you know, understand the persona, just describe the customer journey, use that to extract out what are the real challenges, what are we facing in this, uh, level the playing field, so learn to draw, get everyone to, to work in the same sort of medium, and then do exploratory and refinement sketching so that you can get something on, on a wall and select, build and refine. Um, I think all of that's a little bit abstract. Still, so what I'll do is I'll quickly show you a uh, time lapse uh, video from one of those two hour sessions. So here's the, the workshop. There's three walls running with three teams. I'm uh, setting up the session, giving them the design challenges that they'll be working on. Uh, you'll note everyone is drawing. Uh, they're, small teams are really important, and they're, as they're, they're, they're doing stuff, they're putting up on the wall and, uh, and using that as a discussion point. At some point, all of us are going to sit down and Half the work is drawing, half the work is sharing back. So about around now, I think it is. Um, you'll see everyone sit down, uh, and then each team stands up, presents their, 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 their solution. We gather feedback on the fly, throw it up on the wall, and um, continue on. So that's the first team. You'll see everyone will turn, and then they'll move on to the second team. Um, I think in these sorts of workshops, you need to be kind of brutal. So you'll see uh, once they're presented, at the end of it, I basically stand up, yell at them and say, rip everything off the walls. Now recombine your two flows into one flow and we'll use that as input for the next session. Um, so uh, they're exciting, they're kind of fun uh, and I think it's that kind of speed that, that, that you should be aiming for when developing ideas. So yeah, so that's the kind of output. Um, I think what's important is there's not only the customer journey here, but there's a release sequence there. So we had three different releases that we were aiming for, and that's the bit described in red. Is it repeatable? Yes. This got picked up by the whole of REA. Uh, the, the one on the right I'm particularly proud of because that was the iPad team doing the sketching on their own without me being there and then using those sketches to extract out the story. So uh, that's wonderful from my point of view. Um, so I look around. Not too many sceptical people. I know what you're thinking or what you should be thinking. Um, this is not going to work. This is complete crap. It's amateurs throwing bad ideas at a wall. It's never going to hang together. Um, you, you must be wrong. Um, but my response is, you have to understand what we're trying to develop here is the proposition. What are we proposing to offer the customers? It's not the exact execution. Um, and for any designers in the room, um, it is the best design brief you will ever get. Highly visual and 
uh, a very clear articulation of, of what the problem is. Because that's what you want to you know, grip on the problem. So yeah, designers still need to do their thing. They, they get in there, uh, do the, uh, the, the kind of interaction design and graphic design that, that they're very skilled at. And generally, uh, moving from sketchboards into prototypes and testing, and then basically producing a, a design blueprint, which is a high fidelity view of that sketchboard, uh, can happen uh, fairly quickly. That in, this was a large project that happened in about six weeks. Um, and uh, it's, it's, again, a great place for facilitating conversations about real things. Um, so that might move into the agile build, uh, where, again, the continuous design delivery thing is about incrementing and iterating. Uh, and I just want to say, again, that, that you have time to design. You have time to do design exploration, because you have, in this method, the entire delivery project to refine your design. Uh, I say to design as well, you know, if I give you about three months to design something, can you do it? Yeah, easy. What if we start de delivery development on the day that you start designing? What? You know, that's the kind of reaction. But it's, it's the job to, to, to manage both of those things. So how does it play out in terms of timing? This is the uh, iPhone uh, project. So fairly high level, I would say, sketched out view in a, in a few days. Moving into higher fidelity kind of wireframes by the end of the, the kickoff workshops. You can see there we, we're extracting out the best likely and worst case estimates for features within that. Um, fair, after that, rolling straight into uh, the, the build phase. And for the first two iterations, about around four weeks as a designer, I was kind of left alone and, and given the time to explore while they, they did a lot of technical setup. Um, and then you know, around 12 weeks later, um, we, we, we released with, with release one. I have to say the design was completely collaborative in the sense that the developers had as much uh, input into the interaction as I did. Um, and the point is it's continuous, so release one is just release one. We fairly quickly rolled into release two, uh, a graphic uplift, addition of bookmarking functionality uh, and all that. So I, I, there's, there's one thing that I definitely know, and that is that no designer could have done this up front. No designer could have created a spec that described the, 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 the subtlety of the interactions and the transitions in this application. Um, it, the only way that this could have been done is, is, in, is in that sort of collaborative, evolving way. Um, and it's a great app. You should, you should download it. Uh, so and a last thing on REA is uh, I think if you don't work in a space that looks like this, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, what's happening here is you've got a card wall that describes uh, uh, managing work in progress. And you've got right next to them a set of designs that show uh, where, where we're envisioning this thing will go. Um, and there's an always on display to your offshore team so, or, or non-collocated team members. Um, it's kind of messy, I know, but uh, uh, that's, it, it felt right. So um, again, Scott's going to talk about uh, some of the technology enablers that, that allowed that project to happen. So in talking about the mobile space, this is a bit different from the web applications we've talked about before. And, and we need to do things a little bit differently. We no longer have the ability to deploy the application out to the cloud and get it on, on the web and then let people all over the world try it out and give us feedback. So we have to figure out other ways of doing that. Um, so one of the key considerations here is getting stuff up on the screen quickly. So uh, the team found that it was really important to get the, turn those designs into something tangible that you could put on a device and see and play with, um, and, and then get that feedback. And that was probably more important than, than um, optimizing the experience for people. So particularly when we're talking about native applications like this, when we're talking about iPhone, iPad applications, Android applications, there's quite a bit of optimization required. In order to create a, like, a pleasant user experience, you have to write things in the native components um, and, and, and then spend some time figuring out how to make them respond quick, more quickly. Um, so what, one of the, the things that the team did, there were a few things. One is, is um, using, in some cases, HTML views within those native applications to be able to, to just create the design and get it up there and make it do some fundamental things quickly and then get that feedback. And then later on, when, the op when it was time to optimize, rewriting those HTML views in, in, in terms of native components. There was also a conscious effort to separate what was, the, um, what was the user interface, what was the visual screens, the frames on the phone from the business logic. So that happened both in the design of the application that ran on the handset, but more importantly, there was a conscious decision to move a lot of the business functionality in the back end. And I think this is a point that people often miss when they're embarking on the mobile journey, when traditional businesses start, uh, know that they need to, to uh, work on the mobile channel. 
they think it's all about building handsets. And, and what REA found is that um, they consciously pushed a lot of the business logic into APIs that were available to a variety of channels, available to, uh, to the handsets, to the various handsets, available to the web, available to partner channels, and so on. And what mobile, the effect that mobile is having on people is that they're having to rethink how they expose their core data outside the boundaries of the enterprise. And, and, uh, and, it's and, and actually, the work involved in, in exposing that, those capabilities, those ca core business capabilities as services, uh, is sometimes much greater than the act of building a handset. Uh, handset. You can get somebody to build a handset application in, in a few weeks, perhaps, but getting, creating the data um, I and making the data in, available in a form that can be pushed out to the web or pushed out to the mobile customer is a different uh, proposition entirely. That's, the handset is really the tip of the iceberg there. Um, another thing that, uh, that REA did was to get the application into as many hands as possible during the development. So um, there's some screens here from TestFlight. So they used a, a product called TestFlight, which is kind of changing the way people are doing uh, iPhone development. It's like an internal app store. So um, you, before you push things out to the Apple App Store, you can put it, make it available internally uh, for beta testers and so on. It, in this screen, you can see it, it actually it collects Analytics, which is an important factor as well, getting feeding the data, not just the, the anecdotal experience, but the data back to the de development team. Um, so R REA basically employs the entire organization as beta testers. So they every every few days that the iPhone team pushes a new version of their applications out to test flight. Um, people internally can download. There's like 200 people internally that download the application um, and use it give that feedback back to the development team. And so they're, they're con everybody becomes a beta tester for this application. And these are just some screens showing the, how, that takes, how that works um, within the organization. So, okay. so uh, again, another uh, enterprise level case study. Um, Suncorp and uh, one of their insurance arms, AAMI. Um, again, big. <laughs> Uh, big in terms of the kind of company and, and, and these processes can work. So um, I'm not going to take you through another set of pictures of people working in workshops and sketching and doing that kind of thing. I think, I think that, that point has come across. Um, but I guess this is a case study where uh, perhaps this is a common situation where the underlying product, the, the legality and the, the, the complexity of the PDS, the underlying product was fixed. Um, but where we do have room to move and where, where continuous design, continuous delivery really kick in here is, uh, or partly kick in, is in our ability to, to, to shift and evolve how we offer that particular product to the customers. So uh, one of the things that happened in this project was that we had a continuous stream of user testing throughout the build and the persona itself changed during that, that, that period. It changed from guys in utes uh, who were tradesmen, that's, that's who we thought we were targeting, um, to uh, women who were small business owners who ran all the finances for a small company. And there was a subtle shift in language and a, a subtle shift in um, the, the way that we portrayed people um, that, that, uh, that really sort of helped a lot in, in terms of positioning the product. Um, the other thing was, again, the information radiator idea of having stuff on the walls, uh, a technique where as the user testing was running along, a visual way of basically saying, we got some good comments on this page, green post-it notes. We got negative feedback on this page, red post-it notes. And so it was fairly easy to see what the feedback was coming in. So rather than getting a, a big, thick document, uh, which would usually be at the end of the project, it's too late, um, you're getting that, that constant feedback and, and understanding which, which parts of the application are working, which aren't. Um, but really, this is uh, one of those uh, moments where technology took the lead in terms of uh, innovation. Um, and so Scott's going to talk a little bit about, um, about that. Yeah, so earlier uh, Jason talked about John Norman and, and the, uh, his observation that there's two types of innovation. There's incremental innovation led by designers and there's also radical innovation uh, that occurs in step changes and is often led by innovations in technology. And one of the things, I, I, what I'm showing here, um, this data, is the performance. So this is the V8, V8 engine, the V8 JavaScript engine that underlies Google Chrome. So this is the performance of that JavaScript engine over time, starting in, from the initial beta of Chrome, which was sometime in 2008, to um, Chrome 10, which was sometime in the middle of last year it was released. And what you can see there is that the performance that, of JavaScript in V8, and, and the, 
the same is true for performance of JavaScript in other browsers, in other non-WebKit browsers. Um, it underwent about a tenfold increase. So there was an order of magnitude improvement in performance of, in JavaScript that occurred between you know, 2008 and, and 2011. Um, and, and, and what this does is it opens up the possibility of what we can do with JavaScript. Now it happened that one of the developers on this project happened to come from the Google, he, he had spent some time in Google Summer of Code working on, on the V8 engine. He was aware, this was two or three years ago, he was aware of this evolution that was taking place in JavaScript. And um, if you've ever used an insurance quoting application, normally they go back to the server every time. It's a wizard, uh, you, you answer some questions, there are some new questions generated as a result of those previous questions uh, that you have to go back to the server, you go back to the rating engine and whatever. Um, we've built these applications many times and the general consumers experience is that it's, it's a bit sluggish and time consuming to go through there. So the, 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 the insight here was maybe it's possible to do more of this in JavaScript. Maybe we can create a wizard-like application, but we can do more of it in JavaScript and do more of it in the browser. So that was a, that was a, bit, that was a bit revolutionary at the time. Um, nowadays, we build applications like that all the time. I, we, have, we call them single-page JavaScript applications. We're all around the world. We're building uh, we're building things like we're treating JavaScript much more as a platform. We have frameworks uh, and tools that we can build. We can use JavaScript as the platform running in the browser to build applications, and we can build them with the same level of quality and performance as we get in server-side applications because we have a lot more tools available to us now. And the result of this was a very responsive, pleasant user experience. This application uh, won the, uh, the uh, Australian IT Industry Association, the AIIA, awarded it the Innovation Award, the 2011 Award for the Most Innovative Financial Services Application in Australia last year. It, um, and I am told that people call the call center just to tell them how pleasant the experience was on the web. It, it really created a new kind of responsiveness and experience for people buying business insurance over the web. Okay, so um, the last case study, which I have to make clear I, I, I didn't work there, uh, was uh, what do enterprise startups do? Um, so uh, how, would, how would Facebook approach this? Uh, and before I talked about balanced teams, um, I was lucky enough to go and see Adam Siri talk in San Francisco about the way Facebook approach product innovation. Um, and there was a lot in it, but one of the things was uh, how they structure their teams. So they balance a designer, a product manager and a full-time researcher, a full-time researcher with um, three or four devs. I, I've never worked on a team that's balanced like that. I've certainly never worked on a team of seven who has a full-time researcher. That's how seriously they take the measure learn part. Um, so yeah, it's important. Um, the next one is our bonus secret squirrel case study. This is what you get for not having left yet. Um, and uh, it's quite ex exciting. We, we don't actually know all that much about it, but what we know is it has secret biotech coolness, uh, and that's as cool as it gets. So no joke. We, now Scott will talk a little bit about it. Yeah, so like Jason said, we don't, we don't, I don't actually know what this uh, application does, except it's in the biotech industry. And, and, but Jason and I have spent quite a bit of time talking to the team about how they're doing things, and it's an interesting story, so I want to be able, I want to kind of see if I can relate this story to you. Um, when the team arrived, uh, there was a startup, and um, a number of professionals who had an idea uh, to build something. And, and they, but um, they spent literally months talking about what that thing was that they were going to build. Um, and it's like you're trying to build a hoverboard. Um, uh, what's a hoverboard? Nobody has never seen a hoverboard. We don't know what it is. And, and it, the, every time that we tried traditional approaches to envisioning or to creating a product roadmap, people would just get confused and get balled up. So the traditional sort of inception activities that you do if you were if you were building a new insurance quoting application or something something a well-trodden path that you've been down before. Um, finally, almost out of frustration, the team said, "You know what? Let's just build something. Let's the, let's stop talking." and let's go build something. We're going to build a few screens and we're going to show it back to you. And, and for the first time, that unstuck the log jam and, and got things going. And, and they found that, that building this application, showing it to people, and under, going through a, uh, a cycle of almost hourly or daily uh, where there, there would be conversations with the customer um, and then, and then the, a designer, the, on the front end team, there's a des one designer and one developer working very closely together, um, work designing in the medium as we discussed, and, and then creating those designs and feeding them back 
to the, um, to the customer. And sometimes throwing stuff away. In many cases, it would be just, just building stuff and throwing it away. Um, of course, the cloud was very important in doing this. Um, what they found was an interesting, an interesting effect that being able to deploy things into production immediately had on the mindset of the customer. So if, you, if you're deploying something and you know that there's going to be a UAT phase, and you know that there's going, we're going to have to find the production environment, and, and that when we go into production, it's not going to be quite the same environment as, as we had in, in testing or we saw in the developer's machines. Um, there's a tendency to, to put off making decisions. And, and uh, what this team found was that when they, de they deployed into Amazon EC2 from the first day they started building this, and they did their ethos, they deliberately adopted an ethos was, we, this is, this, whatever we have there, in Amazon could go live to the market any day. And they made sure that the customer understood that. And so when you come to somebody and you say, you know this button, do you think it should be over here or over there? Uh, what color should it be? You know, rather than saying, oh, I don't know, let's see how, uh, we'll do some, uh, wait till UAT, we, ha we have some time to make that decision. Instead, when they know that they're gonna build that today and it's gonna go out and we could possibly release it to the market tomorrow, it focuses people and creates a sense of urgency that they didn't have before. I use this, this idea of craft, but it's, it's getting the right people and it's adopting the right attitude. So um, one of the things that, uh, there's an old friend of ours, Dan North, um, has coined a lot of terms, but one of the terms that he, he has, uh, that, that I think applies particularly in this case, is the, the concept of deliberate discovery. And there's, the, you, you will note, there's a thought experiment you could play. And that is, go to a team that's just built something. You've just built an application. Um, the application's released. Go and ask them, if we were to start from scratch today, and we were going to build this application again, and you had none of the stuff, we had none of the code that you'd written to build the application to start with, none of the environments, how long do you think it would take you to recreate it? And usually you'll find that the answer comes back someplace between one quarter and one half the time that it took them to build the application. Now there's a subtle but really profound implication of that, I think, and that is that the product of building software is not the software itself. The product of building software is learning. And it's really gaining that, it's, it's the entire team undergoes a learning process and the organization undergoes a learning process when you actually build stuff and get it out there. And the question you have to ask is, is everybody capable of doing this? One of the things that, about this team is it was very skilled. Um, you know, there's uh, Steve McConnell, among other people, have written about the, the difference in quality of developers uh, or the difference in productivity of developers if you take a cross section. It's, it's almost a 10 to 1 difference. And I think you've all noticed, you know, there's, the, there's, there's one developer on your team who probably does 10 times as much work as the others. Um, it's what you, in order to work this way, in order to work without a net and to engage in this kind of deliberate discovery where we build stuff, knowing full well that we might throw it away the next day, or that we build stuff with the kind of quality that we need to be able to extend it into something, a completely different business uh, model the next day, you need to have the right people. You need to have people that adopt a craftsman-like mindset. You need to have people that understand that we have, there's two words up here, paying attention to quality and working fast. The conventional notion is that if you are paying attention to quality, you are sacrificed, that it's a zero-sum game, that you have to trade quality for speed. There are a lot of people who understand that this is not a zero-sum game, that quality enables speed that when you build things the first time around with the right kind of quality, it enables you to go faster later on. And so you, you need to find out, you need to find the people who are willing to do that, and you need to keep them. And you need to think about these things like Daniel Pink says, you know, autonomy, mastery, purpose. You need, the people who are capable of working this way, you need, they are scarce in the marketplace and you need to retain them. And you need to give them enough room to experiment and learn. You need to give them the ability to master their craft and you need to give them a strong purpose for moving forward. So that's the, yeah, that's the, the top secret undisclosed uh, uh, application. Um, so we think that we've built, the, hopefully what we've shown you is a number of examples. We haven't explicitly laid out what is the framework, what is the framework for innovation, but, uh, but I think now is the time we want to wrap up and talk and you, have you think about what it is that you can do, what can you take back into your business and what is this framework? It's not accidental inspiration. It's something that, that's deliberate. It's a process and it's creating the right, it's creating the right management uh, atmosphere and it's, and, and it's allowing people to do the exploration they need to respond 
So what is this, what is this framework? So uh, the, one way of looking at it is, is a combination of people, process, and technology, not surprisingly. We talk about these three terms a lot. With the people, we, first of all, we talked about interdisciplinary teams, right? Uh, Jason says balanced teams. So this is, this is not cross cross-disciplinary teams, right? This is, inter this is people who actually learn each other's business. This is developers who learn how to design, and designers who sit down and understand the, the benefits that technology can bring them. So it's really, it's really uh, intermingling those disciplines. Co-located, it's really important to, for people to sit together, and if not sitting together, to have some really rapid uh, mechanism for communication between the team. And it's important to have the right people. It's important to find the right people that, are, that want to work in this way, that want to improve the way that they're doing that, that, that understand that learn the real, the real benefit, the real outcome of all of this is, is not some, is not a dollar, it's not a, a working system, it's, it's learning. And then you need to give, you need to have the right process. So um, what we, just to recap what we've talked about here is a very brief period of doing rough sketches up front. Uh, engaging the whole team, engaging developers, and, uh, and a lot of those pictures you saw of people sketching, those weren't designers, those were developers, they were business people, they were testers, there was all, all kinds of people involved in the sketching process. Um, but not spending too much time on that, and then start to start building, and, then, and, and start the, the build uh, and, and learn cycle, right? So start building stuff, get it out there, get the feedback, adapt, and, and evolve the product over time. It's purposeful tool sets. We need the right tool sets. We need the right mindset, and we need to, uh, and we need the right quality. So it's building things from the quality from from the ground up with the right kind of quality. I think is important. So just to wrap up, does your business have one of these? Um, if not, you need to start the question. You need to start the conversation. You need to start asking the right questions. So uh, this is what the process of exploration is about. This is what the process. Of, of lean startup is about is posing hypotheses and testing them out by building stuff and getting it out to the market quickly and, and learn. Um, if you're interested in uh, talking about this further, there's a couple of books uh, written by thought workers. Uh, we would be happy to have a conversation with you. The question was, uh, how, so we talked a lot about, we talked about Amazon Web Services. Um, if, if you're not if, if you have security restrictions or other kinds of compliance restrictions in you, that, that um, limit in what you'd be able to do with the cloud and, and sending things outside of your organization, things you can do. So first of all, we, don't have, any, we have no formal relationship with Amazon. We, we, we really like the AWS services because they, stay, they are always way ahead of the competition in terms of providing infrastructure as a, as a service. So uh, you know, things like uh, you know, they're constantly evolving and it, and they were first, and they recognized, they sort of recognized this, the innovation benefits of the cloud versus the cost savings benefits. Um, but we, you know, some of these things were deployed on Heroku, um, you know, we, Rackspace is, an, is another one that, that we use a lot. So um, there's a local provider, Ninefold, that's, uh, that, so we, we don't have any particular bias there. But anyway, um, there's a couple of things. First of all, the, you don't need to move your production data into the cloud. The, you can get a lot of the benefits we're talking about by moving the application into the cloud and having the right security in place for communication across whether it's, whether it's uh, a extended VPN into the cloud or whether you're only using the cloud for development. So one thing we've done um, with one of our customers is we've built the, the whole continuous delivery framework such that it can go into their VMware, their internally hosted VMware cloud, or it can go into EC2. So the development teams tend to work, uh, you know, spin things up quickly and shut them down in EC2, but then when it's time to go into production, they do this, the exact same framework to, to, to release into their, v, their VMware cloud. But I think if you look at a lot of the compliance stuff, I don't think it's really been tested. I mean, this is, this is a, a longer subject, but you know, APRA wants a, is concerned when there's a material relationship. We're not talking about moving all of your core data into the cloud. We're talking about building applications and building a channel between that core data and, and, and providing the right security there. Getting the right balance between how much discovery you do and research uh, before that sort of phase and how much you do 
uh, after that phase is, is a difficult question to answer, actually. Um, but in, for example, the REA phase, they had a fairly continuous uh, customer engagement uh, model where they were, they were talking to people. So we had, when we developed the personas, we had data. But the most important thing was that the entire uh, workshop group had to turn that data into uh, into personas that, that they owned. Um, I think that was that was that was the important thing. Um, and the the continuous approach to research, um, I think, if if I had to, if I had to choose one today, I'd say it doesn't doesn't matter when, doesn't matter whether you've done research up till now. The right answer is to start it now and make it continuous. Um, so meeting people once a week, so four users one day a week, uh, that's what we did on the iPhone project, worked a treat. We, we learned a lot about them. We managed to beat the, the application into shape. We, we did three iterations of the search and refinement bar, which normally wouldn't, wouldn't happen without that, that sort of level of feedback. And as a designer in this sort of continuous design delivery loop, um, I think one of my roles has shifted away from designing uh, interaction to creating empathy with the team, empathy around the needs of the customer. Um, so yeah, there, there is, there is, in some ways, no need to do upfront stuff, uh, but it but it certainly helps when you're creating personas. Um, in terms of the, the business side, uh, look, usually you've got a fairly capable bunch of people who've been in the organisation for a long time and have that context. It's a matter of them sharing it with the team. So, I've been reading the the Lean Startup book by Eric Ries, and he insists on how important it is to have like uh, cross-functional uh, people within your team. Um, <coughs> And um, I found out, I think that this part is the most complicated and I would like to know how, how we, like so far what I've noticed working in my environment is that cross-functional people, which are, not, which can be really versatile at heaps of different things, are extremely, extremely aware. Like the first picture that you shown uh, with geeks, you know, um, Geeks, I mean real geeks, which are really competent at what they're doing and knows a lot of stuff, they are extremely rare. And when you're talking about Suncorp or big organization, those, ga those people are really, uh, really, really rare. Uh, most of the time you're dealing with people which are not cross-functional. Uh, and also I don't really understand how being cross-functional, um, is, is, isn't it a, a risk there to lose specialization? Um, and this part for me is the biggest, I mean, from a practical point of view, that in theory that's brilliant. I mean, I love it. I, I wish I could do it like every day. But in, practi in practical, for big organization, I get the feeling that being cross-functional is the biggest flow in this, in this overall model, so. Well, for one thing, we, I mean, at ThoughtWorks, we, tr we deliberately try to hire generalists. So there is, some, there is something to being able to identify and retain those, the people who can work in, in that way, right? That's, that's important. But, you know, one of the things that Toyota found, and if you read some of the, the, the lean literature, is that people are capable of far greater variety of tasks than they're given credit for. That when that um, we are we have our mental maps right and be, and we have we are rewarded in big enterprises for certain kinds of behavior and re, we are rewarded and and trained to to do that one task and do that one task really well and when you and what Toyota found was that when they cross train people and it may require some deliberate training it may, it, may, it doesn't happen automatically. You know, it's, it's, you can't just throw somebody in in a ta in a job that they've never done before. But when you, you put a little bit of effort into cro into training people, um, they, they they their intellect really blossoms, and their capabilities and what they contribute back to the organization are multiplied. And I understand. You know, there, yes, there are a lot of people who are who are, have been rewarded their entire careers for behaving in a certain way that that may have trouble adapting. Though that's true. And look, one small thing to add to that is that you know that the idea of building balanced teams is about creating business teams, not development teams. So teams that teams that are charged with success for the entire business, not just delivering on someone else's requirements, and having that stupid conversation. It's like, oh, what do you want? Hi, my name is Keith. I work with ThoughtWorks. Um, 
I just wanted to draw people's attention to the May issue of the Harvard Business Review, which is a special issue on innovation. And I was struck by a number of things in here that are consonant with what Scott and Jason have been talking about. So there's one on innovation, in, uh, there's a number of articles. There's one on innovation and product development. And they talk about six fallacies that companies fall into in trying to innovate product development. I just want to read four of them. Processing, these are all fallacies. Processing work in large batches improves the economics of the process. Our plan is great. We just need to stick to it. The more features we put into a product, the more customers will like it. We will be more successful if we get it right the first time. All fallacies. The other thing that I wanted to draw your attention to was how organizations think about funding innovation. And, they, and they, there's this monitor group that is studied across a, a huge number of industries. And they found that um, about, in terms of investment, most companies invest, and it, it changes depending on the industry. Like it's, le it's less so this way in, in technology companies. And I'll comment on that in a second. Most companies invest about 70% of their R&D and innovation efforts in stuff that's close to their core. So slight tweaks off existing products or services. They spend about 20% of their budget on adjacent services, so selling existing products to new customers or new products to existing customers. And they spend about 10% of their R&D or innovation budget on really transformational stuff or, you know, McKinsey kind of Horizon 3 out, way out there. But the big payoffs, and that, and that was the interesting part of this article, was they found that in terms of return on investment, you get about 10% out of core activities, you get about 20% out of adjacent activities, and 70% or what they call the blockbuster return on investment is off that 10% that you put into transformational. So obviously you've got to get that balance right in terms of how you make those investments, but for a lot of companies, the big payoff is going to be in the transformational stuff, and not coincidentally, that's where ThoughtWorks likes to work. We've had some of that stuff go. We've had some of that stuff going on for a while, and what I'm finding is we're about two years into the journey, and I'm trying to figure out how to maintain the momentum and the enthusiasm and the excitement. We don't have new, we don't hire new guys all the time. We do in fits and spurts, but how do you keep everyone really motivated and doing the things they need to do to keep bringing out great product continuously? Uh, I'll take a small crack at that. So I, I think one way is that, that this, this whole thing in some ways is about empathy, about getting a greater connection between your, your entire organisation, devs, developers and your customers. If you start to really feel the need and you see those people every day and you understand their life, it's kind of exciting um, uh, servicing them. Uh, you know, when I get bored, it's when I'm too far away from, from the customers. When I get excited, it's when I feel uh, closer to them. And um, that's, again, another reason to, to make research continuous and, and open it up a bit, uh, because um, sitting down and talking to uh, uh, people about their life and in the example of real estate, you know, uh, what, what makes them excited about, about their homes, how they see the future, and what role our services play in, in facilitating that is exciting. Uh, it, that, that's, that's what motivates me. But. I, well, I, yeah, technical people are notorious chasers of shiny objects, and, and it, I, I, I don't know. I, I, right now, I think focusing on getting, bringing new people into the team and challenging the technical people, the experienced technical people, to mentor and teach the things that they've learned, I think, is, is one thing that, that creates new opportunities and, and stimulates people. But it, it's something, you know, providing that kind of variety is certainly a challenge once, once you're in business as usual mode, once you're in it. it rotating people through the BAU work and, and the, uh, the new product work is also important to make sure that you're taking the learnings that you're getting from the new product work and feeding it into your business as usual work. What have you found is the best way to get feedback from the masses, um, you know, without actually having to get a small sample size, which is not really scalable? Uh, essentially, that closing the loop post-launch, um, the, the role of, of ongoing evolution of product management um, beyond uh, the setup stage is, is, is something that uh, we're learning to do. Um, it's, not, it's not our bread and butter. Um, the analytics and, and really trying to understand uh, the customer through data is something that um, I would argue everyone in this room needs to get better at. Um, so I, I don't have a lot to say on that, unfortunately, um, which is frustrating for me and you. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, 
but the same, the, same, the same approach and the same philosophy is there, that, that learning should be continuous. We've certainly got a way of, of, of kicking in that learning early and making it part of the development cycle and the early releases. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I'd say more mature product managers who have had something out in the market and evolved it over the last three years would, would have a better answer than I do. I, th I think that the analytics, the first thing that comes to my mind is analytics. And, and uh, the, the notion that you could, during development, during the development phase, uh, set up a few things to measure and then set the, and, and configure that on Google Analytics and then be sure that you're measuring the right thing um, uh, going forward is is wrong, right? You need that some. I think we need to think a lot more about collecting data tools that allow us to collect and track uh, user because storage is cheap right now, right? And we get and we have many more ways to store and access and process large, lar larger and larger data sets. Um, I, I think what I see people doing is using tools like Splunk or something like that to, to, um, to record user behavior and record all the data they can. And then later on, you can ask ad hoc questions. Um, the, the, you know, the idea that you, we have these fixed um, data warehouses that, or, or analytics uh, that, that we can set up beforehand and those are going to serve us forever more is, is going out the window and we take, need to take the same sort of flexible approach to analytics that we're taking to building the application. Yeah. I mean that, that's why I sort of paused on that full-time researcher role at Facebook because understanding that data is difficult um, and most of the time when I go in and I say so you know as part of the, the setup show me show me what's going on show me your stats and typically the conversation goes well as you can see we get a spike here and I'm like what does that mean? We don't know. I don't know, I don't even understand how to use this tool. It's like, okay, cool, let's move on. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, there's, there's not a lot of insight. I've never really had a meaningful conversation with any product manager about user behavior that's been statistically driven. Not one. It's pathetic. There are people, there are people though. I know some people who do. Who do. Can I speak to this? Sure, yeah, I'll hook you up. <laughs> Bring statistics into the market research area. Yeah. Okay. When, you, when you're dealing with um, sort of old legacy um, systems and you want to start bringing them into this framework, and, you know, there's obviously challenges around they haven't been built on a framework that allows for you know, uh, you know, continuous uh, delivery. What, what's the, the, the major obstacles or challenges you find in getting these sort of applications into a continuous delivery framework? Um, well, that's a good question. It's not, it's not what I can answer in one minute. But. Uh, I can tell you the, that w the challenges that we run into is the notion that you can purchase a product like an enterprise service bus that's going to fix it for you. That it's not, that it, it, this isn't about buying, a, it isn't about big, getting a big platform and creating yet another group in the middle, an integration group that's responsible for bringing all these things together. I think it's, I, I just heard it just real quickly, I heard an interesting uh, Donald Saul, who, who wrote The Upside Turbulence, talks about three different kinds of management, uh, ways to execute, to, to take advantage. One is by power, it's command and control. Uh, I'm going to use my hierarchical authority to tell you what to do. There's process, where we create processes that are sort of self-sustaining. And, and, but neither of those, power doesn't scale, process doesn't adapt to the, to the innovation. The third one is promises, is making promises. And I think, and I, I would like to see enterprises move much more to the, the promises style in terms of their enterprise architectures and being able to, to have ownership of capabilities and to, to have groups, own those, the owners of those capabilities within organizations make promises and, and keep promises to each other within the organization. That's a, that's a bit abstract. I'd be happy to talk some more detail about it if you want later. So thank you to Jason and Scott, please.